Music is the organization of sound in time. Everything you hear in every musical domain is caused by different loudnesses following each other at different times and rates. This is how the ear and brain respond to the most elementary waveform and to the largest scale musical events. Therefore, rhythm is the quality that synchronizes the listener to the performance, calling forth a physical response, whether through dancing, foot tapping, or simply feeling the music. This video will explain a few basic rhythmic concepts and then provide demonstrations with a drummer's help. Rhythm marks time. I can clap a steady pulse at a slow tempo, about 50 beats per minute. Or at a moderate tempo of about 100 beats per minute. or at a driving fast clip, a uh, tempo of about 200 beats per minute. In the 1960s, the tempo would determine whether a couple held each other for a slow dance, as with the Beatles' moody song, This Boy, or did not for a fast dance, such as would accompany some other guy. Tempo can change within a song. Listen sometime to how the Beatles shift into halftime for a dramatic effect uh, in the old-fashioned endings of Sweet Georgia Brown, which they recorded with Tony Sheridan in Hamburg in 1962, or I Got a Woman, which they taped for the BBC, or Love of the Loved, which they performed uh, as part of their Deco audition in January 1962. Tempo can be applied to the musical surface charged by the combination of every sound you hear or to groupings of layers, as provided by the drummer's various drums and cymbals, or to any specific individual elements that might require more interpretation on the listener's part. For instance, one could concentrate on the rate of chord changes. We call this the harmonic rhythm of a song. In Slow Down on the Past Masters album, one could hear the chords changing twice as slowly as a blues normally would until the last line of every verse, which proceeds at the normal faster pace when the singer suddenly expresses urgency. So in Slow Down, if you listen to the first verse, which begins uh, at 34 seconds into the song, you'll hear the chords changing pretty leisurely at 45 seconds and then at 51 and at 56 seconds, but then the pace picks up quickly for that last line and you'll hear the chords change at 58 and at 59 seconds. The same effect works on a smaller scale in the verse of I Want to Hold Your Hand, also on Past Masters, in which the repeated first line proceeds with chords changing every four beats, but then the refrain comes in a rush with chords changing every two beats when John and Paul turn from having made polite requests to suddenly express their ecstatic emotions. I will play just the bass line and chords to emphasize this change in harmonic rhythm, but will not play the melody. First, the slowly changing chords of the first line. But then the refrain comes in a rush, with chords changing every two beats. The same game played with what we call harmonic rhythm, where one measures a varying rate of chord changes, contributes to a tense contrast between stasis, or standing, and agitated motion in I Saw Her Standing There, the opening song on the Please Please Me album. So sometime, see if you can hear the different rates at which the chords change in I Saw Her Standing There, and see if you can feel the effect that those different rates of chord changes has. Pulses are organized and become beats when some are accented in relation to others in a regularly recurring pattern of strong and weak. This phenomenon is called meter, 
whereby accented and unaccented beats are measured and grouped, creating a metric framework for each song against which surface rhythms may be performed. Let me demonstrate the three most common forms of meter heard in pop and rock music of the 1960s. First, we'll talk about duple meter, where there are two beats per bar, and the first beat of every pair is accented in relation to the second. The most common meter is quadruple meter, where you have four beats per bar. And so it's sometimes called 4-4, four, four, sometimes called common time. In quadruple meter, the first beat of every four is accented in relation to the others. And then in triple meter, sometimes called waltz time, there are three beats per bar, and the first beat, the downbeat, is accented in relation to the second and third beats. and the Beatles use that occasionally. Remember these meters exist in the abstract. You can feel the strong and weak beats. You can tap your feet to them, but what you are actually hearing in the instruments and the vocals may be either working with that meter to support it or maybe subverting it by playing against the meter. In the early music of the Beatles, geared towards mass entertainment, Meter is stable and rhythms are simple and repetitive in comparison to their later music, which is much more complex in both meter and rhythms, and therefore more often appreciated by contemplation than by taking to the dance floor. Most rock music has a recurring pattern of four beats, with the first beat, the downbeat, being metrically strongest, the third beat next strongest, and the second and fourth beats weak. This pattern is often emphasized by the bass player. I'll demonstrate with Paul McCartney's bass line for the verse of She Loves You on Past Masters. The downbeat is often identified by chord changes as suggested by the bass line I just played. The fourth beat is often called the upbeat, like an intake of breath that is answered by the strong exhalation of the forceful downbeat. Sometimes the surface rhythm follows the meter supporting it, and sometimes it goes against the meter, subverting it. This kind of friction, this subversion, we call syncopation, a rhythmic accent of a metrically weak position. Rock and jazz are largely syncopated musics. Going against the flow is what leads to backbeat emphasis and offbeat emphasis, and what gives rock its fundamentally anti-establishment quality. With the backbeat, the metrically weak second and fourth beats are dynamically accented. I'll demonstrate here by playing chords on the backbeat, that is, on the second and fourth beats, while the bass line emphasizes the metrically strong first and third beats. Beats are normally divided and subdivided into as many parts as can be articulated. The metrically weak second halves of beats are considered off beats and may be marked in syncopated lines. I will play just the beginning of the bass line and vocal part from Tell Me What You See from the Help album of 1965 to show how the bass line establishes the meter while the melody changes notes on the off beats creating syncopation. Uh, first, I'll just play the bass line on its own and then I'll repeat that, adding the syncopated vocal part. Syncopation is normally energizing, 
yet presented in repeated, predictable patterns in the early music of the Beatles. The intro to I Want to Hold Your Hand, though, is an early example of pulling the rug out from underneath the listener before the strong beat can even be established. Just try to predict sometime the exact downbeat on the word I at the beginning of that song. This early example will later be followed by many other instances of unpredictable syncopation across the Beatles' career. Bottle Rocket Recorders, and I'm joined by drummer Billy Harrington, uh, an Ann Arbor session drummer. We often think of the drummer's primary role as being the foundation for the band, and chief among those uh, responsibilities is to keep a steady tempo. We know from the first session the Beatles had at EMI in June 1962 that Pete Best could be all over the map, uh, in Love Me Do particularly straying from 66 to 76 beats per minute. But Ringo would also be erratic. For instance, uh, when he's playing bongos in And I Love Her, the tempo can fluctuate pretty wildly there. But even at the drums, uh, steady tempo is not necessarily Ringo's primary consideration. And we think of the May 1965 recording of Bad Boy where Ringo seems to let John drag the tempo drastically as the song goes on. So, other than keeping a strict tempo, we hope to demonstrate that there are many other ways in which Ringo makes his role central to the Beatles' sound. Billy, can you show us a little bit about the basic roles of the bass drum, the hi-hat, and the snare in fundamental timekeeping? Yeah. So uh, the bass drum generally takes up uh, the stronger beats of a measure. So beats maybe one and three, sometimes just one. You'll see Ringo um, does that pretty much because he wants to marry with Paul's bass, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the snare drum plays on the, the, weaker, the weaker beats, but sometimes it's accented the most, beats two and four, or some sort of uh, variation between that. Um, and the hi-hat, I think the hi-hat is kind of a frame. Um, to these beats. So it'll play quarter notes, eighth notes, basically uh, some sort of subdivision to, to, to frame, um, frame the whole thing, kind of puts it all together. If he's closing the hi-hat, he, he loves to kind of um, double with the snare drum. So whatever the snare drum is doing, you know, if it's playing on two and four, he'll close that at the same time. Um, often if he's playing on the ride cymbal, he'll have that, he'll have that going the whole time. Great. Can you um, demonstrate the downbeat on the bass drum and then add the other parts of the kit just as a basic fundamental sure. uh, yeah. pattern? One, two, three, four. Excellent. So let's look at particular meters. So for instance, I want to hold your hand is in quadruple meter or 4-4 four, four common time. Uh, could you demonstrate the basic pattern for I want to hold your hand? So uh, he plays a dotted pattern on the bass drum, right. and he's playing backbeat on the snare and sweeping eighths on the, on the hi-hat. Right. Could you demonstrate the dotted pattern and show how that's different from just a straight quarter note rest idea? One, two, three, four. Right, so you alternated measures where you were playing a, a dotted pattern with that fast note as opposed to just the straight quarter rest, quarter rest. Right, yeah. Uh, and so A Taste of Honey is an example in 3-4. Yeah. Uh, can you demonstrate how Ringo just laid down the basic 3-4 pattern uh, with his brushes? One, two, three. So 
so there you hit the downbeat on the bass drum. Uh, the second and third beat of each bar were backbeats that you played on the hi-hat. Right. And then you played the downbeat on the snare and then just had a continuous like a wash. Is there a particular name for that technique? Um, just, the, you know, the... a lot of people say it's like a pushing, mm -hmm. pushing kind of motion. Uh, some people say stirring. Ah takes it back to that sort of jazz era. You yeah, know, brushes nice, more common. nice. Ringo didn't use the brushes very much. But. No, and, and I was surprised to hear that kind of, you know, pushing going out for Ringo because, you know, it, we just don't see him do that at all. Mm -hmm. But clearly he was, you know, he knew about that, that uh -huh. style. Cool. Okay, and so uh, an example in 12.8 meter, uh, which the Beatles use uh, sometimes, uh, you really got a hold on me would be a good way to demonstrate mm -hmm. that. So the bass drum uh, has the downbeat, the strong beats, and the snare is playing the backbeat. And then you articulate the three divisions of each beat on the hi-hat. It has a very rich, mellow, swinging kind right. of feel yeah. to it. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. At the time the Beatles' career began, it was fashionable to take traditional songs that might have originally been in triple meter and to transform them by playing them instead in a straight-ahead rock beat in quadruple meter. Thus, they copied Tony Orlando's four-beat arrangement of the 19th century parlor song, Beautiful Dreamer, which had originally been a waltz. In My Body, they followed a slow introduction in the traditional three beats per measure uh, with a rocking version in four. Billy, can you say something about the use of the drum set in a few styles just prior to the emergence of rock and roll and maybe by a few early rock drummers? Yeah, uh, well, the, the birth of the drum set is essentially out of necessity, right? Because budgets became smaller and the percussion section turned into uh, one person. So the role of maybe the bass drum in a marching band or a classical sense um, turned into the right foot of someone. Um, same thing with the larger crash cymbals, which basically turned into the hi-hat, uh, a snare drummer, you know, that, that all turned into one person, um, simply because it, it had to be done. Before, maybe before the, the 50s or so, any, any music that the drum set was used in, it was highly dominated by the drums. So even in, even in those big band recordings, you hear um, you hear much more drums than you do cymbals. And I, I kind of relate that to early rock drumming um, because you have still a very, very uh, pronounced sound coming from the snare drum and the bass drum. Cymbals um, are mainly used for, for color or, or for framing a groove um, or for really uh, amping up the intensity if it's necessary. Right, so could you give us an example of uh, how an early drummer might have played on an Elvis Presley track or on a Buddy Holly track. Yeah, um, you know, those, those recordings are, are very uh, snare drum dominated, in my opinion. You hear this kind of backbeat rhythm that's always based off of the snare drum. The snare drum really adds that uh, rock intensity. Uh -huh. But then what the happened cats. with Peggy Sue? Uh, well, the, you know, the, uh, snares off, I think, and... Um, oh, he's playing on the snare drum. Um, I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, some live footage, you know, you see him doing the paradiddle on the tom and the snare drum. Uh-huh. So can you demonstrate the regular approach to snare in the early rock playing, and then maybe some of that Peggy Sue sound? Yeah. So, uh, you know, an Elvis track might have something like... Um, strong backbeat on the snare, right. a shuffle on the hi-hat was pretty typical. Yeah, I think so, yeah, coming out of the swing air, a lot of those tunes, especially the you know, early country music too, has that uh, heavy triplet involved. Um, and, and of course, uh, Peggy Sue, uh, a paradiddle rudiment, 
kind of a jazz thing, I suppose, but it sounds something like this. So. <laughs> Sure, I'll spell out the sticking, yeah. So uh, it, the paradiddle rune is right, left, right, right, and then off the left hand, left, right, left, left again. So speed that up a little bit and you basically have Peggy Sue. interesting is that drummers in the 50s often had a background in rudiments, whereas in the 60s, uh, session drummers would often have that background, but the drummers within a rock band would not have learned that sort of thing. And right. so it, it's a very different style of drumming from the 50s to the 60s because of those rudiments, so that's a big part of it. One uh, drummer out of the ordinary there is Mickey Hart of the Grateful Dead, whose mother was actually a champion rudiments player. <laughs> yeah. Billy, you've got a Ludwig kit there, and it's a very special Ludwig kit. Can you tell us something about Ringo's downbeat kit and how your kit is like Ringo's and different from Ringo's? Yeah, so um, early 1963, uh, Ringo purchased this first Ludwig kit. Um, which was a downbeat series, the catalog name. Those drums were of the smaller sizes. You have an 8x12 tom tom, a 14x20 bass drum, and a 14x14 14 floor tom. He also had a, a matching wood snare drum that was called the Jazz Festival. Uh, it was a 55 x 14 model. And he often played it with the calfskin head, which we have right here. So your kit is a vintage 1966 Ludwig kit right. with a black oyster pearl wrap and you've got a jazz festival snare drum right. right there. So is this a virtual match of the exact kit that Ringo acquired in May 1963? Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty close. The 66 is a pretty good match. Finding something that's earlier than that is uh, you know, far and few between. And, uh -huh. uh, How about the cymbals? Um, you know, Ringo's drum technician of couple decades just told uh, Gary Astridge, who's another Beatle and Ringo a fanatic. Um, and we should mention Gary Astridge's uh, website on Ringo's drumming Yeah, uh, and his drum kits is just uh, one of the two top uh, sources of information on Ringo's kits, the other being Andy Babiuk's uh, Beatles gear book. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. He, he, he mentioned to say that uh, that the, the pair of hi-hats that was used on all the Ringo recordings, all the Beatle recordings were a uh, 14 inch set of Zildjian Ace, which I happen to have right here. Pretty common symbol. Um, he often played a, a smaller, maybe a, a lighter symbol on his right side, um, an 18 inch usually. Um, he, you know, used that for pretty much the majority of his ride symbol work and some crash. Um, he liked to lay into that like a crash. It was thinner, so it allowed for that. Um, and his left hand symbol was actually larger than his right which is a bit unusual, uh, mainly reserved for crashing, doesn't use it too often at all. Um, Ringo really, I think, likes to stay on the hi-hat and then uh, what we'll call a ride cymbal, but he plays, you know, he uses that for multiple applications. So this downbeat kit with the 20-inch uh, bass drum, uh, this is what Ringo first acquired in May 63, and his second uh, Ludwig kit that he got for the Ed Sullivan performances uh, in February 64 was also the same size. Right. But then um, several months later for the world tour, uh, he acquired a larger uh, drum set. And how was that different from the, the uh, downbeat? Right, so that, that outfit was called the Super Classic, which was a nine by 13 inch tom. Um, just as a reminder, this is an eight by 12, so a little bit, a little bit larger. Um, a 22 inch bass drum instead of a 20 like we have here and a 16 by 16 floor tom. Um, again, this is a 14 inch floor tom. So just bigger sizes um, in which he starts to experiment with tones I think a little bit more in the studio. They start to go lower in pitch. He likes to tune them more slack. Is there any more volume from the larger uh, drums that they might have realized they weren't cutting through the crowd noise? That's Yeah, that's, that's an interesting um, that's an interesting observation. I haven't really thought about that. Because you, you normally think they would want a tour with a smaller kit. Right. Just for... Make it easy. Yeah. Yeah. It around. A little more practical. Um, 
Yeah, and the downbeats tend to be to be tuned up pretty high, um, almost like a jazz tuning in a way. Interesting. Okay. So let's get to some musical uh, aspects of Ringo's playing. Uh, rock drummers only occasionally emphasize a metrically strong beat. When Paul and Ringo accent the strong beat in an early September 1963 take of Hold Me Tight, Paul says that's a little bit like Running Bear. Can you show us what that was like by counting in and then playing a few bars of Running Bear? Sure. One, two, three, four. Much more often, rock drummers will bring out the backbeat, accenting the weak second and fourth beats of the bar, which is a simple form of syncopation. This contributes strongly to rock music's energy and may even suggest a defiance of authority, a defiance of the status quo. It's Ringo's default pattern to use the backbeat throughout his work with the Beatles. And by late 1964, the backbeat will also be emphasized by electric rhythm guitar chording, and uh, a little later, even by keyboard chording. Billy, could you remind us how the bass drum, hi-hat, and snare usually contrast the strong and weak beats with the backbeat emphasis? Sure. One, two, three, four. Could you show us how Ringo sets up the tempo for the January 1963 performance of Keep Your Hands Off My Baby? One, two, three, four. A film of the Beatles playing Some Other Guy in the Cavern in August 1962 shows Ringo peddling the hi-hat on backbeats. Can you demonstrate that? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Ringo often sticks the hi-hat dividing each beat in half, the on beat and the off beat, and he will often do that while playing the back beat on the snare. We might think of the verses of the early 1963 recordings of There's a Place or Thank You Girl with the hi-hat is closed. Or from that October's I Want to Hold Your Hand, in which the hi-hat is open for verses, but closed in the bridge. Show us the sound of the hi-hat sure. open and closed. All right. One, two, three, four. In a way, Ringo's 3-4 playing is a form of backbeat where the first beat of every bar gets downbeat emphasis. The second and third beats are both treated like backbeats. Could you play a bit of the verse of I Just Don't Understand, which the Beatles performed for the BBC in July 1963? One, two, Let's cover two more basic underlying patterns, the shuffle and what we're calling the surf backbeat after Daniel Glass's book, Commandments of R&B Drumming, which Billy brought to my attention. Pete and Ringo both play the surf pattern in many numbers. It's heard elsewhere in Dick Dale's Miserlou, in the Beach Boys' Surfin and Surfin' Safari, in the Shadows' Man of Mystery. This is a regular backbeat pattern with snare rests on the strong first and third beats, and one hit on the weak fourth beat, but it differs by dividing the second beat into two hits, so you end up with a rest, hit, hit, rest, hit, rest, hit, hit, rest, hit, rhythm. For me, it seems to combine uh, an aggressive, forceful drive with a touch of nonchalance. We might think of Pete's work in Hamburg in 1961 on My Bonnie, or in the January 1962 DECA audition with Hello Little Girl, or maybe Ringo's 1963 recording of Not a Second Time, for which he plays a surf backbeat on the snare with steady eights dividing all beats on the ride cymbal. Can you count this off and demonstrate? Uh, move from the hi-hat to the ride, 
and then show us how you use your hand to mute the ride cymbal. One, two, three, four. In the shuffle, the beat is divided unequally into long and short parts. Can you demonstrate? Yeah. One, two, three, four. This is heard in many early covers, especially as a variation of the surf pattern, as in I Gotta Find My Baby, or Young Blood, or In Chains. But no original Beatle composition from 1963 relies on the shuffle pattern. Only interior sections of cover songs will shuffle, so a performance might start out with a straight backbeat pattern in the verse, move to the shuffle for the bridge, and then return to the backbeat for the returning verse. In this way, uh, John Lennon's I Call Your Name from 1964 puts a spotlight on the guitar break by moving from a straight to a shuffle pattern for the solo. Or an entire song might be based on shuffle patterns, but include an intersection in which the shuffle is articulated more forcefully or is articulated in some noticeably different way than is done in the outer passages. We hear this in uh, songs such as Why Can't You Love Me Again, A Taste of Honey, and Don't Ever Change. Could you give us a taste of this effect by playing three phrases in straight, in shuffle, and then in straight rhythms? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Thank you very much, Billy. No problem. We've been demonstrating fast-moving surface rhythms. Rhythm can play out along larger scales, measuring relationships among events that may last for several seconds or for much longer periods each. We speak of phrase rhythm to indicate how lengths of phrases relate to each other. In rock music, four-bar phrases, in which you can count four beats four times, are the norm. But this is one domain in which the Beatles will explore lots of new terrain in their middle period and late work. But even their first A side, Love Me Do, heard on Past Masters, plays with unusual phrase lengths. In the main section of Love Me Do, we'll call it the chorus because its lyrics remain constant in each hearing, you should be able to count out one phrase of six bars, followed by a second phrase beginning on the word please, of seven bars. And I'll show you how you can count this out. I'm going to clap each beat, but just say the number for each bar uh, for two phrases, six plus seven. And I'll count this out at about the tempo of Love Me Do. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's more subtle than that, though, and open to interpretation, because this six plus seven division represents the end of a repeated two bar idea, two plus two plus two, and the beginning of a new seven bar idea. But one could also divide the structure of this passage into an even more unusual nine plus four, based on the entry after nine bars of Paul's solo vocal and John's harmonica. So listen to the chorus of Love Me Do and see if you can count out bars of six plus seven and see if you can also count out alternatively for the same passage phrases of nine plus four bars. 
Phrases may also be rhythmically marked by suddenly placed silences or abrupt changes in texture that allow one unaccompanied line, usually a single vocal part, to stand on its own given a momentary spotlight. We call this effect stop time. Time does not really stop as the listener unconsciously does continue counting right through these changes of texture, but it carries that sort of effect nonetheless. It may be dramatic or exciting or suddenly revealing. Think of the ending of Please Mr. Postman on With the Beatles, where John chants, check it and see one more time for me to hand claps and drums only, while the bass and guitars suddenly drop out for John's dramatic pleading. It's as if the outside world vanishes, leaving only the singer and his heartbeat. This bit of stop time was arranged in the studio, perhaps at the suggestion of George Martin. The decision being made at some point after take three, which still presented the Beatles' early concert arrangement, which had the instrumentation continuing throughout at this point. For another example, go back to Slow Down, which we mentioned earlier, and notice how John Lennon's vocal is emphasized when accompanied by silence and by drums alone in stop time passages at 42 to 45 seconds, and again by silence alone at 59 seconds to a minute two seconds. The stop time effect works to bring out the urgency of the changing harmonic rhythm we spoke of earlier. Moments of stop time can occur anywhere in a song, particularly effective at any number of points along a 12 bar blues structure and is heard in dozens of such early covers. Paul's solo vocal entry in Love Me Do, delayed by that six plus seven stretching of phrase rhythm we spoke of a moment ago, is made all the more dramatic by a fleeting stop time preparation on an upbeat. John and Paul recreate exactly this effect at the start of every verse of There's a Place. Through stop time, the Beatles pull back the curtains on the bass drum in Do You Want to Know a Secret? Can you find that moment? See if you can spot the emergence of stop time in Long Tall Sally, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, Baby It's You, and All My Loving. We hope you've enjoyed this introduction to rhythm and drumming. You'll need to understand a number of terms we've covered, as we will make use of them later. These include meter, rhythm, and tempo, the concepts of harmonic rhythm and phrase rhythm, events such as pulses, beats, accent, beat division, and syncopation, the metric placements of downbeat, upbeat, backbeat, and offbeat, and common rhythmic patterns such as the surf backbeat and the shuffle. Finally, make sure you're clear on the various parts of the drum kit and how they're used, the bass drum, the snare, the hi-hat cymbals, the tom-toms, and the suspended ride and crash cymbals.